All right, Doc, we got some good questions this week. I'm going to let you... Uh, I'm reading them again. Yeah. <laughs> People yeah. are not going to know I have you one, are anymore. Man. I have one for you that I got after I sent you those, because usually I'll send Doc a uh, day before the, the questions so you can review them for you guys. Not that I look at them in advance, but, <laughs> but I have a chance sometimes. Right? Sometimes you do, because you need to do some research. Yeah, yeah. But um, but uh, I got an extra one that I'll, 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 I'll ask you uh, myself at the end. So. Okay. okay. Well, the first one I have listed here is I'm 63 years old. Started transdermal TRT six weeks ago and went from sub 300 to 1300, I'm assuming nanograms per deciliter of testosterone. My primary care physician said it is too high. <laughs> Seeing some benefits already and don't want to go much lower. Um, okay, and that's all uh, he writes. I'm sure it's a he since we're dealing with those levels. But um, after six weeks, I'm sure he is feeling a difference. It usually takes about six weeks to kick in. And um, a couple things that deserve mention. One is your assay of testosterone is going to depend upon when you did your last application. Mm. Um, he's using transdermal uh, TRT. So, you know, if he, if he applied the testosterone at 6 a.m. and then went in and got his blood drawn at, at, at 7 a.m., well, he's going to see a peak. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a very different assay, say, uh, that if he skipped his dose until after that day, or if he did his application at 6 a.m. Uh, and did his uh, test at, you know, 5 just at closing, closing or uh, does his testosterone application at night at 5 or, or before he goes to bed and then got up in the morning and did it. So the number isn't, I don't want to say it's not important, but it's not really that important at all because we know, generally speaking, um, even if you were a, a, a poor or a really good transdermal absorber, if you were on either side of the curve, which is a very steep curve, most people, they apply it, their skin works like everyone else's skin and they absorb only so much and then they metabolize it very similarly. This is not a sterified form of testosterone. It's not a time release, it's testosterone. And mm -hmm. most people will have uh, the same, what we call pharmacokinetics involved. Their metabolism is at the same rate. So, um, you know, went from sub 300 to 1300, that doesn't really mean anything. What we should focus on is how the patient is feeling. Mm -hmm. It's not about treating numbers, it's about treating the patient. And if they're using, um, my, my guess is that, you know, the standard is to use 200 milligrams per milliliter in a cream or gel form. And, uh, I mean, it's possible to get as much as 300 milligrams in there, but it's not the norm. So again, I'm just taking a guess here. But even with 300 milligrams per ml and someone who's a great transdermal absorber, it's not like you're putting yourself at risk for anything. There's no such thing as a too high a dose. I was going to ask you, yeah. The issue becomes if the dose is so high because the body loves to stay in ranges, you know, if it, it becomes uh, what we call supraphysiologic above the normal range, uh, or where the body feels comfortable, you know, to speak in anthropomorphopologic terms or however we pronounce that word, um, then it will try to bring that number down. How does it do that? It, it, it converts testosterone into something uh, it can, you know, another metabolite like estrogen or dihydrotestosterone. And therein lies the rub. It's not about too high a level of testosterone per se. It's, hey, are we concerned with and are we covering the basis of what it can convert to, which is not necessarily what we want? Certainly, excess estrogen is not what we want. Dihydrotestosterone depends on the situation. You know, if someone has prostate cancer, excess dihydrotestosterone is <laughs> no bueno for mm. sure. It can, it can fuel the fire. Um, if someone already has uh, benign prosthetic hypertrophy, they already have uh, an enlarged prostate, well, uh, dihydrotestosterone will promote more growth. So... Uh, that is really more the issue at hand. And at 63 years old, yeah, prostate cancer is a possibility. So you can always, you know, I always, this is kind of a side note, I recommend screening for it like anything else uh, because it's all based on statistics at age 50, uh, unless it's in your family tree earlier than that, you know, like just like the colonoscopy, you do it at 45 if that's the case. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have prostate cancer. It's just something to look at, again, as a side note. Mm. And, and I, I think more, you know, so I don't go too far off base here. Uh, the issue is, I guess, assessing a 1300 nanogram per deciliter testosterone level as being too high. No. I, I, you know, in my experience, not necessarily. As a matter of fact, typically that reflects something that may be too low. Um, 
And it's why we don't see as much benefit with creams and gels as we do with the sterified forms of injectable testosterone because, uh, you know, uh, um, to get to a free total testosterone of, with LabCorp, about 30 picograms per milliliter, with uh, Quest and others, it would be closer to 300. Don't get me off on a separate tangent. There's, there's a, it's a wild, wild west in some ways when it comes to measuring free testosterone. But, but it represents a level at which most people get full resolutions of, of symptoms. When I say most people, I'm, I'm talking about males again here. Uh, but in terms of testosterone in general, uh, without specifically identifying the levels, it applies to females too. But there's a level at which you, you, you get benefit, below which you're not going to hit it, period. And of course, it varies from person to person. But um, remembering that there's a reason why you have to apply a cream or gel daily, these numbers don't mean that much. Because right. of what I said earlier, they're going to be all over the board depending upon when you, when you grab the blood. So uh, pay attention to how the patient's feeling is, is the number one rule. <laughs> Why do you think some doctors are prescri prescribing uh, testosterone in, in gel or a, a, a daily application versus uh, injectable? I mean, obviously, oh, you're, you're, much, you're much more leaning towards the injectable because it's... Well, for males. For, for males, some reason, yeah. uh, you know, it might have to do with just the, 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 the need for a greater amount of testosterone, roughly tenfold what a female would use. Mm. Uh, and it may also have to do with the difference between efficacy and effectiveness, right? Mm. Guys, and I know this sounds sexist, and I apologize if it is, it's just in my experience, <laughs> it's an observation, don't do as well with daily application of creams, other than shaving cream, if they absolutely have to, mm. than women do. You know, I always joke, I dropped That's my candy true. That's just when true. I didn't buy stock in Sephora because my wife lives there and loves using creams. Yeah, I, yeah. on the other hand, yeah. am always getting complaints about my dry skin because I can't stand having <laughs> to take the time out. So whatever it is, yeah, yeah. you know, if, if you're not applying it, no matter how efficacious, it's not going to be effective, right? Yeah. So that might be one reason, but I think it's more than that. I think along with that, even if someone's very compliant, uh, and I believe all my patients when they tell me, no, I don't, I'm not skipping days and I'm using the full dose, et cetera. It's just not as effective mm. for whatever the reason is. And maybe it's because you spend less time in that therapeutic zone, mm. which is very important. We've talked about this before with testosterone. You got to get to that minimum and stay there or above. Otherwise you're going to drop out of therapeutic range and, and, yeah. and therefore the, 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 the resolution of symptoms goes away. So, um, uh, back, back to guys. Yeah. The, the reason why doctors do it may be because, that's what they know. I mean, a lot of the the introduction into mainstream in, in TRT comes from the androgels of the world, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the testims, I mm -hmm. think was the original version. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the way we did it. And, and, and people in general, I think, uh, at least used to be, and probably still are. I mean, if you could do something without having to poke, in yourself, poke yeah. yourself with a needle, I think most people would prefer that. Yeah. But, uh, I, you know, there's a lot of reasons, I guess, and it's, it's all guesswork on my part why, yeah. why, why it starts that way. But for those that are practicing regularly and have patients who are willing to inject, it is absolutely a no-brainer to go with an injectable form for males. And for females, I would argue it's, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other when it comes to efficacy. Um, and then, of course, you have oral forms. You know, you have the undecanoate now that you can take orally as well as injectable form. But it just... Uh, it has to do more, I think, uh, with doctor's ease rather than patient's ease. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it should be left up to the patient, yeah. right? Yeah. Do I feel more con uh, comfortable doing an injection once a week, self-administered, or, or even coming to the office for it? Yeah. Or, or do I, would I prefer to do it with a gel or even an oral form that might take, you know, four doses a day? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It's the best yeah. I could do an answer or yeah. answer that question. All right. Good. I'm sure they'll be happy. So, um, well, there's another short one. So does, is that uh, IGF-1? Yeah, it looks like yeah. It. So does IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, cause cancer 100% or is it safe to use? Wow. Well, <clears throat> first of all, the body produces IGF-1. When, when growth hormone gets produced and it starts circulating, it hits the liver and the liver then will be signaled to create IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. And as a matter of fact, it deserves mention that IGF-1 does a lot of the yeoman's work that GH doesn't get or does get credit for. 
Uh, there's a receptor for uh, GH on every fat cell in the human body, which you know leads to release of fatty acids. And, and so growth hormone, I think we've talked about this before, is really best used for, aside from regenerative purposes, for body compositions to, to lose fat rather than to put on muscle, right? We've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. um, IGF-1, though, is similar in effect in terms of you know reducing the amount of fat in the body, um, regeneration, okay? Um, so does it cause cancer? My point is it's naturally occurring. No, it doesn't cause cancer. Uh, if that were the case, then you know we'd all get cancer as soon as we started growing up in the world, right? <laughs> uh, it was pretty much as soon as we're born. Uh, growth hormone is responsible for uh, largely for long bone growth, but also for well flat bone growth too. But uh, but also for organs. So yeah, that would be a problem. Now, if you do have cancer already extant in the body, then yeah, growth hormone will make it grow faster. So it's mm. something you would want to avoid. And again, I'm, I just said growth hormone, but because it converts to IGF-1 and IGF-1 has the same effect, uh, you would want to avoid using growth hormone or IGF-1. Now, there's a theory that's probably not even worth mentioning, but since I just started, I might as well finish. Uh, you could make an argument for, a theoretical argument for a hard to treat, treat cancer that didn't grow very rapidly, that was resistant to any other kind of treatment you could come up with, that you could hasten its demise by combining chemotherapy, which deals best with rapidly, um, uh, rapidly turning over cancer, rapidly dividing cells. Uh, you could combine growth hormone with chemo to make it more effective, meaning you know, if you've got something that's slower growing and you speed up the growth, the chemotherapy will more, be more effective. Mm. But that is absolutely theoretical. And would have to, you know, be subject to a lot of study. So, like I say, it's probably not even worth mentioning, but it's a theory. Um, so, as a general rule, to answer this question, does it cause cancer, whether it's GH or IGF-1? No. Is it safe to use? It would depend upon whether you had extant cancer or not. Can you get screened for cancer? Absolutely. We okay. have a lot of ways to screen for cancer, both with imaging, uh, with what we call uh, liquid biopsies, you know, blood tests. Um, I use Grail now because it can test for a number of cancers. I think there are over 50 now cancers that they mm -hmm. can test for. Well, before you jump up and down and go, yeehaw, uh, with different levels of accuracy, we'll call it sensitivity and, and, and specificity is the term we use. Um, but for some of the most prevalent cancers, it's got a pretty high specificity and sensitivity rate. Uh, and for some of the others, it's nice to at least get some sort of screening that gives you some idea. Uh, and of course, the more you test, the more, like, you know, it's, it would get expensive, but you could increase the, 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 the odds of detecting something the more you test it. But before that, remember, it was Oncoblot, but that, and that was testing for Enox2 proteins, and that was bought up by a Chinese gentleman and company and disappeared mm. into China. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some other liquid biopsies coming down the road uh, from... Um, I'm not even sure I can tell you who it's from because he wants me to be quiet about it for now, but a name you'll know when they come to fore with it. But there are other ones that you can do through uh, blood tests. You know, we can screen for uh, various, uh, you know, we can find single markers, a CEA-125, which tests for more than one type of cancer. Things that let us know, give us a hint that something's going on, uh, whether it's, uh, I want to say like a B19 for a pro... Uh, pancreatic cancer. Anyway, I can go on digging into my memory for some of these things <laughs> in, inaccurately or accurately or not. But uh, yeah, there's tools. And, and I would advise using them as particular as an yeah. older yeah. candidate, as it were, for, for this. I mean, if it's a concern, that's something they may want to consider, you know. I mean, if it's... Why not? If you have the ability to yeah. test, why yeah. guess when you can test? Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. So uh, it's generally safe uh, but yeah, you, when you're talking about a 20 year old, yeah. But when you're talking about a 60 year old, it might be a good idea if for whatever reason you're, you're using this, which you haven't even gotten into mm. that you screen for that first. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Thanks doc.